EA now is in, into the, the next phase of follow-up, when, when the children that we started to see are adults. And of course, one of the outcomes no longer is just the symptoms of the disorder, but it's other things like substance use and substance abuse. Uh, the funding for our project has shifted over from National Institutes of Mental Health into the National Institutes of Drug Abuse, from NIMH to NIDA, and that's uh, Brooke's specialty. So uh, those are the two key people, and I think everybody else is important uh, on this list, but I'm not going to go through each one, but I thought you should uh, uh, kind of have an idea of, uh, of, of the kind of the leadership. Peter Jensen was, uh, is the originator of the study, uh, had the idea and pushed it through to make it uh, the study that it is. And then the, the, the various principal investigators have all shaped the study. Uh, I won't go through the roles of each one, uh, but uh, all these people listed are very important. Uh, the design was very simple. How many people here have done a randomized clinical trial? You know, I was so embarrassed, I never had done one. And I got cho chosen as one of the investigators. Uh, it was because in our area that, that a, a true randomized clinical trial with the methodology of intent to treat analysis had just not been done, which was something, that is a tr true deficiency that needed to be corrected. <laughs> and that's what Peter Jensen and his group at NIMH did. He was head of the child branch at that time. And not only Peter, but several other people had this idea to be a, a major study, a national study, using rigorous methodology, randomized clinical trial, and appropriate analysis for both statistical power and for analysis using intent to treat techniques. So intent to treat, you don't treat, you don't analyze what a treatment a person gets. In a randomized clinical trial, and intent to treat analysis, you analyze what a person is recommended to get, not what they get. And this was foreign to many of us. Uh, Helena Kramer was our statistician uh, who uh, dictated the ground rules for a randomized clinical trial. But we identified uh, children powered to uh, look at uh, a randomized clinical trial with six sites, so we could do things within each site to see if there are site differences, to detect uh, an effect size of, I think, 0.4 with power of 0.8 for any comparison of the groups. And we decided to have initially three groups, and then we expanded it to four. But we diagnosed children, and then we randomized them, hoping to get about 144 per group. Uh, we have a few more in a couple of groups because we didn't shut off the recruitment in time. But we randomized them to four conditions. Medication management, which was at that time uh, medication given three times a day at a titrated dose, where doses were tried from anywhere from 10 milligrams to 60 milligrams. At that time, once a day dosing was not used because it wasn't effective. So this was all immediate release methylphenidate given three times a day. And the titration was uh, weekly, and the visits were monthly for the 14 months, very rigorous. Uh, behavioral intervention, which was uh, very rigorous as well. Uh, uh, several of the psychologists, I'm a psychologist, Bill Pelham, a psychologist, Steve Henshaw, a psychologist, uh, Howard Abacoff, psychologist, Karen Wells, psychologist, uh, a lot of us are in the MTA. And we had uh, uh, parent training classes, uh, more than people would actually come to attend. We'd have a summer treatment program. We had a very intensive behavioral program. The psychologists were kind of betting against the psychiatrists and the uh, pediatricians, the physicians, which treatment unimodally delivered would be the best, intensive behavioral treatment or intensive medication treatment. I put my money on behavioral because that's what I mostly do. Uh, the combination, which everybody thought would be the best, would be those two intensive treatments together. and then. The very controversial group was a community uh, comparison group. We had children that we did not provide treatment for them. The problem with that is that many people say don't do that group because it increases variance and decreases what you can detect in a randomized clinical trial. Over the objection of statisticians, we put it in. So there were supposed to be three groups, but we added the fourth one because most of us had not done a randomized clinical trial. And then we uh, uh, evaluated them. Our outcome measure was symptom severity. Although the statistician said choose one measure, we didn't. I think we had 39, uh, something. 
high number. Uh, we had a great battery, but we didn't choose one outcome measure, which is a big mistake. We've eventually said symptom severity of combined symptoms, both parent and teacher ratings, averaged was our outcome measure. And that actually was the best outcome measure, where best is defined by the largest effect size. We should have done that before we started. So if any of you do a randomized clinical trial, let me tell you, you should choose your outcome measure before you start the study. And you should be one. And it should be simple. This is what we heard from Helena Kramer. Well, we, we did almost that, but we didn't quite follow her directions. Uh, after 14 months, that's the end of treatment. And then we no longer provide treatment. And anybody who enters the trial then is used in the analysis at 14 months. So even if they drop out, even if they don't get medication when they're assigned to the medication condition, they're analyzed in the medication group. It's not what a person gets, it's what a person was recommended to get that's analyzed in a randomized clinical trial. What this does is protect you against all sorts of selection effects of who decides to do this and who decides to do that. You don't know what out there might be operating to undermine your study. So randomization with a large sample size lets you no longer worry about that. Now you have to say, well, maybe only 80% of the people are going to get treatment. Fine. And maybe in the behavioral group, 15% of the people got treatment with stimulants. You still don't analyze them in the medication group. You analyze them in the behavioral group. And now you're comparing not groups that got treatment, either this way, behavioral, or that way, medication, but were recommended to get it where most of the people in those groups did get with high compliance what they were assigned to get. This is very unusual. I really love being part of a randomized clinical trial. It was a fantastic experience, and it still is. Not only that, after the treatment stops, do you stop your intent to treat analysis of what people were randomized to get during the 14 months? No. You analyze this for life. You're analyzing and evaluating the impact of recommending medication. Not whether you get it, not how long you get it, but what is the effect of recommending medication as the treatment versus recommending intensive behavioral treatment. And that's a mindset that is very different than typical when you're doing research. Maybe this is old hat to the people that raise their hands for randomized clinical trials, but it wasn't for me, even though I'm supposed to be an experienced investigator. This is really different. And it still is. Now we're analyzing the 10-year follow-up, and what do, you what do you think we analyze as the first variable, independent variable? We still analyze what you were randomized to get for 14 months after 10 years. And I'll, uh, I'll explain that a little bit as we go along. So uh, this is the timeline. Uh, after uh, 14 months, we reported results in 1999. Who won? The psychologists who designed the behavioral treatment or the physicians who designed the medication treatment? The physicians won. Medication by itself is much more potent in reducing symptom severity than is behavioral treatment when you do it as intensively as possible. And what about the combined treatment? Was it the best? Well, it wasn't any different than medication alone. This, is, this was controversial in its time. And that was long-term effects, long-term being 14 months. Then 24 months. We added a local normative control group, which is different than the community comparison group. The community comparison group is a group of ADHD kids that are not treated by us, but they have attention deficit disorder. The local normative control group are classmates of those children. So we asked classmates of the children at the 24-month follow-up, will you participate in this study? We randomly selected, after the classes went up to about 50% consent rate, randomly selected group match to, to balance for, uh, ethnicity, for uh, uh, gender, for sex, uh, boys and girls. Uh, and then we have a wonderful 288 uh, uh, participant control group of uh, classmates. And then at 36 months, we had follow-up. At eight years, we reported follow-up. We're now doing 10-year assessment. I hate to admit it, but I've been writing a paper for two years. Haven't submitted it yet. 
on the 10-year follow-up. This is a, a, you know, we have to have a process of getting everyone on the committee to agree that the paper is clear and it, 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 it tells the, it's very hard to do that when you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to write a paper on growth, stimulant-related uh, effects on growth, and uh, I published two papers on this, on the previous ones, and I found out I didn't know very much about growth. So I've been learning to analyze growth, and I have a paper that I hope to submit this week on the 10-year follow-up, but it's been taking, uh, it's taken more than two years to write. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, the 12-year data is now being analyzed, and we're funded to go further than that. So this is just a fantastic experience. I don't think many people got, will ever get to do this because it was a major national effort in the United States to do this. Here's the results, and it's, not, it's very simple. I didn't want to summarize each one of those, but over the first 14 months, what happened? There was the symptoms, 0, 1, 2, or 3, 1.8, it's pretty high. Those symptoms dropped down to about 1. 1 is just a little. So what does my mother say about just a little? The symptoms of childhood is no longer considered a disorder. That's pretty, pretty potent response. Uh, and medication and combined both did that. But the behavioral treatment dropped, but it wasn't as much. So that difference was significant. I'll not struggle with that anymore. I'll try. So that difference was significant. And this is the community comparison group. And then what happened? By three years, there was absolutely no significant difference between the groups. So in a randomized clinical trial framework and intent to treat analysis, the initial relative benefit of medication over behavioral treatment, which was a very big disappointment to me because I was on the losing side, actually dissipated. There's no difference. And there was no uh, effect that emerged later. Again, all the way out to eight years, there's no difference in the uh, experience children had and families had over the first 13 months with intensive treatment combi uh, comparing uh, behavioral treatment and medication or the combination. The relative benefit, and it's very important to say relative benefit because all the, the treatments tend to work, but the hypothesis was that this decrease in one of these, medication versus behavior, will be bigger than the other and medication had a bigger decrease. That relative benefit dissipated completely and that's hauled up. However, even though there's a big treatment effect, this is what the classmates are. So there's still significant difference, even when you treat as intensively as you can, between ADHD and classmates. But the treatment effect, we thought 14 months is long term, but now we say two years is, or three years, or eight years. The long, long, long term, this would be long term, this would be long, long term, you can keep adding longs. The long-term effect of medication was significant, but it dissipates over uh, a three-year period of time. Uh, and the uh, normalization, complete normalization of all the, the group doesn't occur, although we did a, a qualitative analysis of this where we saw how many children fell below the 1.0 rating, which we considered successful treatment. So if you have a high score, and your individual score falls below just a little on the average for all the parent and teacher ratings, which then would be childhood behavior instead of psychopathology, we found about 68% of the children benefited from this treatment by normalization by those criteria versus about 30-something percent for the behavioral treatment. But they were still not as good as the local normative control group uh, on 91 percent of the uh, many outcome variables that we had. Pardon? They didn't comment the control group. They didn't get anything. Did it get anything? You didn't comment the control group. It was obviously of the teacher. This uh, community comparison group? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've been cautioned by Gene Arnold not to call it a control group. So I'll have to get you to restate the question to the comparison group. Or Gene Arnold will, will have my neck. Uh, so it's not a control group because it's a comparison group. And uh, about 60% of that group got medication. 
but the medication at that time was 